Welcome to another episode of VMblog's Expert Interview Series. And today we're joined by Ben Sigelman, the CEO and co-founder of a company called LightStep. Uh, they are the creators of one of the leading observability tools for understanding microservices and serverless architectures. Ben, it's great to uh, have you on the show with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. If we could, I guess I'd like to start things off by talking about the differences between uh, something monitoring and observability. I know these words are often used interchangeably in the industry, but it seems like LightStep believes they're, you know, they aren't quite the same thing. Can you dive into that a bit more for us? Absolutely, yeah. I, I definitely have feelings about this. Uh, so observability is never going to replace monitoring. Um, and that's really important to understand because it shouldn't replace monitoring. That would be a mistake. Monitoring in my mind is a subset of the observability problem more generally. Uh, what you're trying to do with monitoring is to carefully monitor, there's that word, carefully monitor something that you know you care about and you know you will continue to care about for a long time coming. And that, that belongs in any sort of observability strategy. There's no reason you should stop monitoring things. And I think the problem is that the tools we've been using to do monitoring, uh, the you know, first among them, chief among them, being some kind of um, time series database or metric system where you have a bunch of charts and alerts, those tools have been um, used, extended to the, and then now I think abused to do observability, which is a much larger and harder problem, which is actually understanding what's happening in your system, particularly when it changes. And, um, What's happened is that we've been using the tools of the trade for monitoring, uh, especially charts and dashboards to try and do observability. And that actually doesn't work very well. And so I think people's responses say, well, monitoring isn't working. And it's like, well, not really. It's just that that wasn't that, what the second thing you're doing wasn't monitoring. Trying to respond to some sort of deviation in your system health is not monitoring. That's investigation. And you need an observability tool to do that. So the way I think of it, you know, zooming out, is that monitoring is a very small but important part of observability. And the idea with monitoring is to, is to, as much as you can, understand the relationship between the health of some part of your system and your overall business. That's really what you're trying to do. And then you need observability to help you, you know, make plan changes more efficiently and to respond to unplanned changes more efficiently vis-a-vis -vis those health metrics. And th that's how the two fit together. And it's not one replacing the other. Okay, so, so it sounds like, the expectation then is that users are going to have both a tool for monitoring, uh, whether that's something like a data dog or whatever, and then another tool like LightStep for observability. Well, uh, there I, I would agree that there is functionality that's specific to monitoring. I, I think ideally uh, the, the workflow for this stuff is very tightly integrated and you don't have to switch tools. And that's, um, if there's, one thing that LightStep is doing in 2021, it's uh, is you know staking our flag in the ground around that particular problem, and uh, you know uh, we have an enormous release planned um, you know this week uh, <laughs> that that we've uh, that centers around an idea called change intelligence, which we can talk about if you'd like, uh, which basically allows. Um, core monitoring functionality to become much more actionable and useful. So I, I don't, I, I mean, whether it's LightStep or something else, having two totally separate user experiences for monitoring and observability, it's not great. It's, it's not the end of the world, but it's not great. Much more, more efficient to have monitoring being a, a special purpose piece of a larger observability solution uh, that can enhance that monitoring and make it more actionable and useful for an organization. Gotcha. And, and so another, you know, sort of interesting thing that to note, uh, uh, LightStep doesn't believe, as far as I, is from what I can tell, doesn't believe in using proprietary agents to collect data, and instead points people towards uh, the Open Telemetry project. Could you talk maybe a little bit more about that and explain, uh, you know, more about the project? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I will talk about Open Telemetry in a, in a second, but let me just move back, you know, five years or so. Uh, it, it was the case for a while that, you know, if you think about observability in the original definition from control theory in the 1960s, you were really talking about understanding the insides of the system based on the data coming out of it. That data is called telemetry. And so it used to be that if you ran um, 
if you ran an application in production, you had a dev team building it and an ops team, you know, managing it, operating it, right? And um, the ops team was, uh, in the olden days, all they had was proc FS, basically. They could run top, they could look at, you know, memory usage, CPU usage, and that was about it. But anything happening within the application was just terra incognito and totally opaque, which put them at a huge disadvantage to do their jobs. So um, the first generation of APM providers uh, came around and um, actually you know, did a great service to the ops teams by saying, look, you just install this agent and we will get application level telemetry um, outside, uh, out of those applications and where you can actually see it. And in a sense, they're providing something that feels a bit like observability. Um, it turns out that the, the observability functionality, the actual you know, diagnostic workflows were very simple. It was basically just like search UIs and charts and that was about it, which is okay. It's like necessary, but not sufficient in my mind. And what you actually paid for was this agent. That was uh, probably 80 to 90% of the engineering effort of those vendors went into those agents. Um, so, okay, fine. If you move the clock forward a bit, there's two big problems that happen. Um, one is that the surface area that the agents had to cover got too large um, with cloud native. There are too many frameworks, too many languages, and they're all running at the same time. So you can't even divide and conquer by framework if you're a vendor. So it was kind of impossible to actually maintain those things. And then second of all, it turns out that the basic search functionality on the, on the observability side just isn't sufficient anymore. Um, and uh, and so a few of us, I mean, I, I, I don't want to claim like I personally invented these things, but I was definitely there and one of the co-creators of Open Tracing and also of Open Telemetry. What we were really trying to do was to solve the telemetry problem, the problem of getting the data out of the application in the open comments and make that a completely vendor neutral, high performant built-in functionality for anything you might depend on uh, and to get, you know, enough of a, of a, ecosystem built around that project that it could be self-sustaining. And uh, that's what we have with open telemetry. At this point, you know, certainly like every vendor under the sun supports it, which is kind of a no-brainer for the vendor because they don't do any work and they get, you know, high quality telemetry um, instead of having to maintain these crazy agents. But it's also a really great thing for customers. You don't have to pay for agents anymore and, uh, and you can send your data anywhere you want. And then it also turns out to be a great deal for cloud providers. So, you know, I announced the open telemetry project um, in, in 2019, and it was me and someone from GCP doing the announcement, right? Um, so the cloud providers have been there from day one. Amazon recently announced their own distribution of open telemetry, which is totally compatible. Uh, and they have you know, dozens of people working on this project full time. Azure has also been there from, from very early days. So you have all the major cloud providers, all the major vendors, and you know, many open source projects from Envoy to Kubernetes to what have you. Um, using open telemetry formats and APIs to get data out of their um, software and into the hands of, um, you know, uh, observability tooling really that can, can put it to good use. So it really has been quite disruptive to the business models for traditional APM. And I think, you know, more importantly, it's been disruptive in a positive way for people who are actually trying to practice observability in that they can get really high quality data without spending any money at all um, or, or, you know, uh, uh, taking on some kind of vendor lock-in. And I know you, you sort of alluded to it already, uh, but you guys have a really big, you know, announcement this week. And I know Lightstep's been working on it for a while now. It's it's called Change Intelligence. Uh, and can you maybe talk about what Change Intelligence is and, and uh, what makes it possible? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the what it is um, to, to make it, you know, as simple as possible. Uh, I think the number one problem in observability is answering a single question, which is like, what caused that change? And the changes vary from, you know, a customer having a bad experience to an SLO being violated to just semantics, like software is not answering the correct, uh, it's not providing the correct answer anymore. Um, and it might even be that your cloud bill just went, went up by a factor of two in two weeks, you don't know why. So changes are all over the place. And then it turns out the explanation for those changes is often in a different part of your system or is actually due to a customer changing their behavior um, or it's due to one of your cloud providers going down or having an issue or what have you. But investigating that is really, really difficult right now because you have to cross service boundaries and team boundaries to do so. And observability, if it can answer the, the change question, um, 
then it can be applied uh, to any one of those issues I talked about a minute ago, as well as any kind of plan change, like a CI/CD pipeline, um, uh, you know, a feature flag, a config push, whatever it is that you want to do. You can integrate observability around that change to de-risk it. Um, so change is really the number one problem in observability, at least the number one kind of unresolved problem in observability. But the reason why it remains mostly unresolved to date is that it's really difficult to do. In order to do that analysis, you have to have a bespoke time series database and a bespoke kind of transaction trace logging kind of database that have to be pretty tightly integrated. And to do that work, it's just really hard. I mean, the team at LightStep has been working on this launch for well over a year at this point. Um, and it's not something you can do incrementally. It's something that has to, it requires like net new technology to be built to make it possible and to make that analysis um, tangible and useful for, uh, for DevOps engineers and SREs. Um, so, uh, you know, I can, I can certainly say more about the technical underpinnings of what we've been doing and, and it's sort of lineage through the work that we did at Google, but um, the change intelligence uh, it's really designed to accelerate plan changes and mitigate unplanned changes very quickly by making change a built-in function, a built-in feature of observability. It is, is, as you know, thinking through the change intelligence and everything you've talked about, uh, how is it different from, uh, is there any correlation to AI ops? Um, and, and then as we wrap things up, you know, how does it ultimately benefit developers, SREs, and other engineers? Yeah, totally. So the AI ops, the AI ops thing, uh, gosh, that term, I mean, it really, it's, it's almost triggering for me. I, I, I don't know if there's a term out there that I, I would be so excited about if it hadn't been polluted by so many, I think, thin pitches over the years. Um, uh, the vision for AI ops, in my mind, is... is um, uh, is a good one where you have you have a bunch of really difficult analytical problems you need to solve. It's either too time consuming or too difficult for people to do on their own. So let's help, have the computers help us and we'll automate um, a part of that process. Um, now the trouble is that uh, I think it's been, you know, in some cases it's used quite disingenuously and is applied to things that really are nothing more than like a histogram. Then you start calling it, you know, artificial intelligence. And then in other cases, um, it has been used in good faith, but you've been using AI systems um, on untrained data to, you know, try to find deviations and things like that. That's actually very doable. At Google, we applied the machine learning infrastructure there to the operational data. And the good news is we were able to find, I mean, I'm making up the number, but certainly more than 99.9% .9 of all deviations or regressions, we found them automatically. Sounds great. The issue is that we found two to three times as many that were false positives. And AI ops, if it's just operating just on the raw data with no training or guidance from uh, systems that are informed by humans, ends up doing a lot of that. And it only takes a couple of false positives to destroy confidence and trust in a tool. Um, so what I think is exciting about the change intelligence piece is that there certainly is some real math and machine learning going into our implementation of that functionality. But because we start with a change that we know is important to the user, whether again, it's a, a planned change like a deployment or an unplanned change like an alert going on. Um, in both cases, we have, we have what I think we would call in a mathematical context, the objective function for the AI ops to actually optimize for. And given that, we can actually successfully rank all the various things happening within the, the entire distributed application to explain that change. And so in that sense, I believe that we're delivering on the promise of AI ops without, um, you know, getting into, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a somewhat ineffective, like false positive written, you know, application of AI techniques to the raw data, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, you know, I, I really do appreciate you uh, taking time out to speak with VM Blog today, Ben. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, uh, any of the stuff, I know we're gonna, you guys have that announcement this week and uh, we'll, we'll push folks towards that so they can learn more. Uh, what's the best thing to, uh, for folks to do if they wanna come learn more about you know, this or anything else that LightStep's doing right now? Sure, well, I mean, the, the product is something that you can evaluate on your own. 
especially if you're using open telemetry, it's extremely easy to evaluate life step. And I would just encourage people, if they're technical, to do that themselves. Um, we certainly have, I think, very uh, well-trained, technically knowledgeable people who can provide demos of any of this stuff and walk through it if that's what you prefer. But those are probably the, the most sensible places to start. Um, and yeah, any, you know, any feedback about any of it is always welcome. I like hearing from people. My DMs are open on Twitter and so on and so forth. So that's always a good next step too if you just want to tell me what you think. Perfect. All right. Well, again, thanks. Appreciate your time and uh, look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you. All right.